Sutra Ananda. If when you see it is not you, it is you and not I who see, then the signature pervades everywhere. Therefore, whose it is it if it is not yours? Commentary Shakyamuni Buddha again called out to his disciple Ananda, do you understand now? I have explained so many doctrines and you are still confused. You aren't clear yet. If when you see it is you and not I will see, your seeing which you can see is not is your seeing, not my seeing. Then the seeing nature pervades everywhere. You have the seeing nature and I have the seeing nature. Everyone has the seeing nature. The seeing nature is all pervasive and there is the same amount of seeing nature in the Buddha as in ordinary living beings. So it is said, it is not more in a sage, it is not less in an ordinary person. At the level of a sage, it does not increase by the slightest bit. At the level of an ordinary person, it does not decrease by the slightest bit. You have your seeing, I have mine, everyone has his or her own and the amount of this is the same. It is exactly the amount people can use. It cannot be insufficient. Just this very point is where the wonder lies. Since everyone has his or her seeing essence, since it is all pervasive in this way, who do you intend to give your seeing to if you don't want it? If you don't dare acknowledge your seeing, whose is it? Then, if it is not yours, speak up and tell me whose it is. Well, at that point, Ananda was once again speechless. He was once again tongue-tied. Sutra, why do you have doubts about your own nature, your own true nature, and come to me seeking purification, thinking the nature is not true? Commentary, why do you have doubts about your own true nature and come to me seeking verification, thinking your nature is not true? Why do you doubt what is yours? You doubt whether your seeing nature is yours, yet your seeing nature is true, actual and not in the slightest bit false. But you think it is not true and you turn to me and ask me to demonstrate whether your signature is yours. With that kind of thinking, the further you run, the further away you get. You are running away from the way, way off the track. You are really pitiful. At this point, the Buddha didn't have any way to help Ananda. It's the same as when my disciples are disobedient. I haven't any way to help them either. The Buddha has explained so much principle by now. But Ananda hasn't listened. All he does is run farther away. The more it is explained to him, the less he understands. Having no way to help him, the Buddha waits for Ananda to reply. Sutra Ananda said to the Buddha, Won't honored one, given that this thing nature is certainly mine and does not belong to anything else, when the first come on and I regard the palace of the four heavenly kings with its supreme store of jewels and stay at the palace of the sun and moon. This thing completely pervades the lands of the Saha world. Upon returning to the sublime abode, I only see the monastic grounds and in the pure central hall, I only see the eaves and corridors. Commentary Ananda said to the Buddha, World honored one, given that this thing nature is certainly mine and does not belong to anything else. You say for certain that this thing nature which can see things is clearly mine and each person's. It is not any other thing. When the first come on and I, you got the palace of the four heavenly kings with a supreme store of jewels. The world honored one has used the strength of his swift spiritual penetrations to take me to see the four heavenly kings. Supreme means particularly fine and wonderful and store means that especially valuable gems were used to make the jeweled palace. And stay at the palace of the sun and moon. We also go to the palace of the sun and moon. 
This scene completely pervades the lens of the Saha world. Now, the scene can see very far and wide. It can see everywhere and everything. This proves that the scene is perfectly pervasive. At this point, some say that the phrase lens of the Saha world and the earlier mention of Jambu Fipa should be switched, but actually it is all the same without switching them. It is not important. All that matters is that you understand the principle at this point. Some people say that the lens of the Saha world refers merely to our world, whereas Jambu Fipa includes lots of worlds. But it is possible to regard the lens of the Saha world as meaning many worlds as well. According to my present explanation of the sutra, the two phrases are not switched. But upon returning to the sublime abode, I only see the monastic grounds and in the pure central hall, I only see the eaves and corridors. The sublime abode is the Jetta grove. The monastic grounds in Chinese is Chia Lan which refers to places where there are Dharma protecting spirits like Quan Di Gung, the one with the long beard and the red face. Ananda is saying, I see there are Dharma protectors that Chi Lan Bodhisattva is here. In the phrase, the pure central hall, the word sin does not carry the usual meaning of heart, but means the center of the sublime abode. When I go inside, Ananda says, All I see are the eaves and corridors in front of me and nothing more. When I went to the heavens, I saw so much more and now that I'm in this room, I see so little. Ultimately, how is it that my sin shrinks? Why can't I see outside? Ananda still has reason to argue. He still wants to debate with the Buddha and have the Buddha consider his reasoning. What he says next is even more wonderful. Sutra, world or not one, that is how the scene is. At first, his substance pervaded everywhere throughout the one room, but now in the midst of this room, it fills one room only. Does the scene shrink from great to small, or do the walls and eaves press in and cut it off? Now I do not know where the meaning in this lies and hope the Buddha will let fall his vast compassion and proclaim it for me thoroughly. Commentary To take on a disciple like this one is a lot of trouble, a big headache. He asks about the long and the short, the great and the small, the square and the round. He asks why the scene can see so much and then so little. Is it that the walls press in and cut the scene off? World or not one, that is how the scene is. When I was in the heavens, I saw a lot, and now that I'm in my room, I see so little. At first, its substance pervaded everywhere throughout the one room. Now the substance of this scene originally pervaded the one room of empty space, but now in the midst of this room, it fills one room only. All my scene can do now is see all of this room. Does the scene shrink from great to small? Is it that the scene is big and then shrinks so that it becomes small? It was the size of the world and it shrinks down to the size of the inside of a room. Ultimately, how does it shrink? I don't understand this doctrine. A balloon is big when it is filled with air, but when the air is released, it becomes small. It is gone or gone. Is the thing like a balloon? Ananda is still making thing into a thing. He still thinks, ah, thing is a thing. I've got to think of a way to use an analogy in order to debate with the Buddha to and win. I'm going to think of a way to invalidate your principle. I'm going to find a way to make the doctrine I speak be the right one and I have you certify me. That is what is going on in Anda's mind. You say that everything I say is wrong. I'm definitely going to find something to say that's right and let you have a look at it. This suspects that Ananda's view of self is particularly just now. 
Why do you say that everything I say is wrong? So then he talks about the thing shrinking. Or do the wounds and eaves press in and cut it off? When I come into the room from outside, the wounds and eaves press in and cut off my thing. How else could it become small after being so wide and reaching before? At this point, I will tell you a joke. Once in China, there was a student who was about to begin his first day of school. His father and mother, who were extremely wealthy, invited a distinguished professor, professor to tutor their student. The wealthy man said to the professor, Don't be too stern. If you can just teach my child one character a day, I'll give you any amount of money you say. In fact, it will be sufficient if you can just teach him to recognize one character. That will be easy, said the professor, and he began to teach the student. The student was exceptionally dull, so the professor concentrated on teaching him the character Yi Wan, which in Chinese is a single horizontal line. He wrote it again and again and said, Look, now this is the character's one. It's called Yi. Remember it clearly. He instructed him for several days and eventually the student did not forget. He remembered the character one. Then one day the master of the house invited the professor for cocktails and dinner. After they finished eating, he took his child for a walk in the garden to look at the flowers. The professor felt very self-satisfied and said, your child is very intelligent. You said he was extremely dull, but I've taught him to read. He's able to recognize characters. The master of the house was pleased and asked, What can he read? Give him a taste and let's see. The professor used his foot and drew a huge character one in the ground. Then he asked the child, his student, What is that? The student cocked his head this way and that and peered at it and finally said, I don't know. The professor said, I've been teaching you that very day is the character one, isn't it? What do you suppose the child said? The one you taught me wasn't that big. Ananda is the same as that child. He says, when I'm outside, I see so much. Why is it when I come in a room, I see so little? It's strange. Do the words press in and cut off my seeing? Now I do not know where the meaning in this lies. Now I don't understand. The more it is explained, the more confused I become. What is going on here? Ultimately, how is it that the seeing can be big and little? I haven't shrunk it. How can it get little? If it can shrink, at least there has to be some shrink it has to be someone shrink it. Perhaps the walls have cut it off. I don't understand this doctrine. Just what is it about? I hope the Buddha will let fall his vast compassion and proclaim it for me thoroughly. Won't honored one put forth great compassion and resolve my doubts and explain the doctrine thoroughly, bit by bit, to make it clear. Instruct me. Ananda is more confused than I am. Now I understand this doctrine, but at the time Ananda did not understand it. Sutra, the Buddha told Ananda, All the aspects of everything in the world, such as big and small, inside and outside, are classed as the dust before you. You should not say the thing stretches and shrinks. Commentary, Ananda just said that his thing was suddenly big and then suddenly little. Did it shrink and stretch? Is that possible? The Buddha told Ananda, All the aspects of everything in the world, including the sentient world and the material world, such as big and small, inside and outside, are clustered as a dust before you. Perhaps they are big, perhaps they are small, perhaps they are inside, perhaps they are outside. All aspects refers to these characteristics and other such forms and appearances. They are all the marks of dust before your eyes. You should not say the thing stretches and shrinks. Sutra, 
consider the example of a square container in which a square of emptiness is seen. I ask you further, is the square emptiness that is seen in the square container a fixed square shape? Or is it not fixed as a square shape? Commentary. Why do I say that you shouldn't say the same stretches and strings? Consider the example of a square container. I give you an analogy. There is a square container, a box, in which a square of emptiness is seen. Since the box is square, the space inside it is square. square. I ask you further. Now I have another question for you. Is a square emptiness that is, is seen in the square container? Is the square space inside the box a fixed square shape or is it not fixed as a square shape? Does the shape of the emptiness become square in the container? If so, then when the container is removed, the square-shaped emptiness wouldn't be able to be united with the rest of emptiness. Is the, the emptiness definitely square or not? If it is not square, then it all but receive and it is just like just seeing. Why do you doubt and think that it becomes big or little, that it stretches and shrinks? Sutra, if it is a fixed square shape, then it is reached to a round container. The, the emptiness would not be round. If it is not a fixed shape, then when it is in the square container, it should not be a square shaped emptiness. Commentary If it is a fixed square shape, when it is reached to a round container, the emptiness would not be round. If you say the emptiness is fixed in a square shape, then when it is placed in a round container, the emptiness would not become round. It would still be square shaped if it is not a fixed shape. If you say that the space which the emptiness occupies is not fixed, then when it is the, in the square container, it should not be a square shaped emptiness. If you say it does not have a definite square shape, then how could it be that the emptiness becomes square in a square container? What is the principle here? He asks Ananda. In the end, would you say the emptiness is square or round? The emptiness is analogous to the scene. You say the scene can, can stretch and shrink, that it can become big or little. Therefore, would you say that the emptiness becomes square or round? Do you see how the Buddha's questions become more and more impossible to resolve? The more questions Ananda asks, the more confused he becomes. Sutra, you say you do not know where the meaning lies, the nature of the meaning is thus. How can you speak of its location? Commentary, you say you do not know where the meaning lies. Ananda, you say you don't understand this doctrine and don't know where, in the end, the seeing is. The nature of the meaning is thus, if you say that seeing and emptiness are the same, would you, say, would you then say that the emptiness is square or round? It, is, it was explained above that if you say emptiness is square, then when it is placed in a round container, it would not become round. If you say it is round, when it is placed in a square container, it could not be square. In the last analysis, would you say the empty space is round or square? The nature of the meaning of emptiness is like this. The nature of the meaning of the seeing you speak of is the same as in the doctrine of the emptiness. Would you say then that it shrinks from large to small or that it is pressed in, upon, and cut off by the walls. The doctrine has already been explained very clearly. How can you speak of its location? Now you understand the doctrine of emptiness. So how can you ask where the thing is? The thing pervades everywhere. How can you propose theories about where the thing is located and ask me where the thing is? Sutra Ananda, if you now wished there to be neither squareness nor roundness, 
you would only need to take the container away. The substance of emptiness has no shape and so you should not say that you would also have to take the shape away from the emptiness. Commentary Why, Ananda, if you now wish there to be neither squareness nor roundness, you want the empty space in the container in the container to be neither square nor round and not to conform the square or round shape of the container. You should only need to take the container away because the substance of emptiness has no shape. The nature of the substance of emptiness is neither square nor not square nor round. It may be either round or, or square. And so you should not say, Ananda, you should not speak without any basis. Don't make casual statements. You should not say that you would also have to take the shape away from the emptiness. To release the emptiness from the temporary squareness it has assumed in the conformity to the square container, simply remove the container. You don't need to do anything to the emptiness itself. You don't need to try to change its shape because basically it has no shape. It conforms to the container, but the emptiness inside is not cut off from the emptiness outside. They are still connected. Ananda, you think the container is an impediment and an obstruction in the same way you think the walls and eaves cut off your seeing, but in fact, Emptiness is not made square or round by a container, and your seeing is not made big or small by walls and eaves. There could be no such principle. How can you bring it up? You shouldn't speak like that. Here, the Buddha goes Ananda.